Erin Hughes is an assistant professor in political science and history at California State University Stanislaus, where she also manages the Sargas Modern Assyrian Heritage Project. Her research specializes in nationalism and nation building, genocide studies and diaspora, with a focus on the global Assyrian Chaldean Syriac diaspora. Erin received a PhD in sociology from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland in 2016 and an MS with distinction in nationalism studies from the University of Edinburgh in 2007 and a BA in political science and history from McGill University in Canada in 2003. Her doctoral thesis examined the growth of the Assyrian diaspora in the U.S and the diaspora's political and humanitarian engagement on behalf of the Iraqi Assyrians following the 2003 war. Before joining Stanislaus State this fall, Erin worked as a Foreign Service and Diplomacy Officer for the Government of Canada. She also worked previously as a policy advisor to Congressman Sander Levine of Michigan and as a legislative aide in the Michigan House of Representatives. Kathy Zayat Satari is a retired Assyrian American attorney with an extensive background in Assyrian advocacy. In the past decade, she has served as a consultant for the Assyrian Aid Society and the Chaldean Assyrian Syria Council of America. Her work has included presentations before organizations and governmental entities, including the U.S. Department of State, offices of numerous congressional representatives, the United States Commission on Religious Freedom, and various state bar programs during this time. Kathy has also spoken at legal seminars hosted by the State Bar of Arizona World Peace Through Law Program regarding the status of the Assyrians as indigenous people in the Middle East. Kathy is also a registered Red Cross volunteer, assisting with the International Red Cross Humanitarian Law Group. Kathy practiced law for nearly four decades in both the public and private sectors before retiring in 2013. She litigated cases in state and federal court and has served as a federal court appointed mediator and arbitrator in numerous matters. Zatari. I'm an Assyrian American attorney and I want to talk a little bit about what the Assyrian genocide means to me. Quite simply it's the story of my family. It's a story of a young woman at the time, my grandmother, who walked from her home in Ada to Bakuba, Iraq, all alone on the road. Thousands of other Assyrians made the same journey. She stayed in the camp, but not until after she had had a horrific time. The Turks and the Kurds killed her first husband. They killed her first two children. And yet somehow she had the strength to make her way alone as a young woman all that way on the road. So the Assyrian genocide to me is my family's story. And it is a story of my grandparents losing almost all their families and losing just about everything they owned. Before the slaughter, my grandparents owned numerous properties in Ada. 
And I have here today a few of their property deeds, the originals, from 1907 to 1916. They describe different parts of the property. They describe vineyards. They describe the roads. They describe the buildings. And the last one, in 1916, describes why my grandmother was the sole inheritor. Why? Because she was the sole survivor of her family. So what the Assyrian Genocide means to me is a survival story, and I'm the descendant, as are many thousands of Assyrians elsewhere, of a, a young woman who went through and beat incredible odds to survive. Welcome to The Modern Assyrian on ANBSAT. My name is Carmen Morad. Today's special interview and program is in the studio where I am joined via Skype from Arizona by Dr. Kathy Sayad Zatari, an Assyrian advocate and activist, and also Dr. Aaron Hughes, California State University Director of Sargas Modern Assyrian Studies from Detroit. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy and Aaron, thank you so much for joining me on today's Modern Assyrian program. Thank you so much for having us. It's wonderful to be able to talk to you both. It's great to be here. Thank you. thank you. Kathy, let's begin by you. Uh, you have been a true advocate for the Assyrian cause. Through years of advocacy, you have spoken on behalf of indigenous people, of the Assyrian people in the Middle East through the Red Cross and different humanitarian and legal uh, adventures that you've had. Tell us about what you're working on now. Well, what I'm working on now is to focus on getting this genocide exhibit up and off the ground there at Cal State Stanislaus. Uh, there is a wonderful Assyrian heritage program, as you have explained, that Dr. Hughes uh, is leading right now. And I got together a few months ago with a couple of colleagues, uh, Hannibal Travis and Ruth Camber. Uh, and we both, or the group of us, I should say, were really interested in putting on a history of the Assyrian genocide exhibit, really focusing on those years, 1895 to 1924, in the last century, as you know, your families know. And this is something that over the years in my other work, I realized had never really been brought to the forefront. There had never been a, a public exhibit of just the Assyrian genocide. There have been very few writings of the period and, and even no public exhibits, artifacts, oral histories, deeds, uh, documents from the era. There has never been a presentation of any of this. And this is why the three of us got together, put our heads together, and decided we would set this up. So this is really our latest program and what we're going to be working on in the coming year. Uh, I think that Aaron can talk a little bit about Stan State and their involvement, but I do want to say I am so happy about Stan State's interest, about the university's willingness and interest to help us put on this exhibit. They have been an incredible resource. Thank you, Kathy. It is wonderful that so much attention is being paid uh, to the Assyrian community and the modern Assyrian history, which includes, of course, the genocide and all of us being descendants of genocide survivors. I know your story, Kathy. We'll talk a little bit more about that and where your passion comes from. Dr. Hughes, let's talk about um, California State University Stanislaus. You are the new director of uh, the Sargis, or I should say the Francis Sargis Modern Assyrian Heritage Project. Can you inform our viewers a little bit more about what this project is about and what its mission and goals are? Absolutely. Um, so it began in 2017 with an incredibly um, gener generous donation from um, Princess Sargas and Jimmy Sargas 
Um, and it really started uh, with building a library um, that housed at Stanislaus State um, in Turlock. And that's grown um, since then into really an effort to both conduct new engaging research um, in modern Assyrian studies and to help amplify and bring attention to research that's helping, uh, happening elsewhere. And um, it's an incredible opportunity to highlight these things, to engage in public history with the community and with other scholars um, across the US and across the world. Um, and to you know help make visible this incredibly important history. And so we were so excited when um, you know, Kathy contacted us about this exhibition because it's so, like she said, it's so important, it's so timely. It's not been done, and it's certainly time that it's done. And so we're just so proud to be able to bring that to Stanislaus Life Date. You know, uh, Dr. Hughes, it, I am so impressed living in that region of uh, how much attention is paid by the direction of the Sargis Modern Assyrian Project and the direction of it with President Ellen Jun, because we talk about quite often about the impact, the trans, or I want to say intergenerational impact of genocide, which continues to this day. Uh, as you know, uh, being a specialist in nationalism and nation building of the Assyrians and diaspora, which is your specialty, why do you think it's important to do these exhibitions and what does the community need to do to be more engaged and uh, to contribute? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the importance of it, like you said, um, is so many layers. It's one, you know, the lived experiences that people continue to carry with them and shape narratives of, you know, who they are, who their family was, who the Assyrian nation is. Um, and it's so, um, sorry, sorry. Um, you know, to talk about the genocide that happened then, um, we continue to see straight lines to the, you know, ongoing genocide that's been happening, you know, in Iraq and Syria in the present day, um, and the ramifications that these issues still happen to have for the Syrian nation. And so, you know, these stories are, you know, part of the same line. And so it's so important to talk about from the personal experience, from the family experience, and from the national experience, um, and to bring attention to all of these different layers and dynamics of it. Uh, is this the first time, uh, Dr. Hughes, that you've been involved in, in such a project that has to do with exhibiting actual items? And, and what do you think those items will entail? As Kathy told us a little bit, but what do you see this project coming together and, and what does the public need to be looking forward to? Um, well, I'm sorry, I realized I didn't fully answer your previous question, which kind of ties into this. Um, I know Kathy's doing an amazing job, um, you know, collect, and she can certainly talk more about what they've um, begun to collect so far. Um, one of the ways that I think um, myself and our program at the university can be helpful is by, um, as Kathy mentioned, helping collect personal narratives and personal histories and personal stories of the genocide, um, whether it's people interviewing us off record or oral histories or being uh, willing to be filmed, um, things that we can, you know, include as part of the exhibition um, and perhaps at some point, you know, share as part of our archive, li our library archive, um, so other scholars and members of the community likewise can have access to these stories and, you know, we can um, help raise awareness and understanding of, you know, the lasting impacts of the genocide. I see. Kathy, you had mentioned that through the years uh, there, there is so much as descendants of the Syrian genocide. You and I have a special connection when it comes to this program at Stanislaus State University. A couple of years ago, you were invited to be a speaker and share your story. And the story that touches so many of us, it touches so many non-Assyrians that hear about the story. Can you briefly tell us about where this passion that you have comes from and how personal it is to you and how much of it drives you to complete a, a much bigger uh, project of this scale? Certainly. As you and I've spoken, Carmen, the main story that I have is from my paternal grandmother, Shakar. And Shakar lived in Ormi. And 
Karen, Dr. Hughes, you know where that is in far northwest Iran. And she lived there in a thriving Assyrian community, and as Carmen knows from, from previous generations. And like many tens of thousands of Assyrians lived in the area in little towns and villages near Urmi. And her little vi village was Ada. And she was married to a man, and, and they had properties and a home and were very established. She had two young children. Well, of course, when the slaughter began and the Turks went through, the first thing they did was they killed her first husband. They came back a year later and they killed her two small children. And the reason I recount this is because, as you know, Carmen, and you've seen, that is in one of her property deeds. And she walked on foot fled on foot, not alone, of course, there were thousands, tens of thousands of Syrians traveling on foot from Urmi, Iran, to the safety of a British camp in Bakuba, Iraq. They fled on foot several hundred miles, these thousands of people. Many died on the way. Carmen, you know that. Yes. Many had to leave ill family members and babies. Somehow this young lady walks all that way having lost everything mm -hmm. to that camp mm -hmm. and she gets there and luckily in those years the churches did a lot to sponsor uh, refugees and they sponsored her to come to the states where she was able to resettle have a life uh, her youngest son when she got here and remarried was my father and i and i often hear from young people well, why does any of this matter? It's 100 years ago. Oh, it's so long ago, and we don't know any of that. And for me, my first point, I will direct to say what my motivation is. Uh, she didn't go through all of that, for all of that to be forgotten. And she is just one person of thousands. You know that, Carmen, thousands. Those people did not go through this for their descendants to forget about it. And it is so important to have a record, to have a creation that documents what they went through. And so my personal, my personal interest is to get opportunities out there for so many descendants like me. And as you know, these survivors are all gone. Their children are elderly. We're down to me, grandchildren, and we're not kids. So it's incumbent upon us to try to capture as much of this history as we possibly, possibly can. In another 20 years, it's going to be exponentially harder to get the oral histories, to get the family heirlooms, to get the documents from the various governments. This is really the time to do it. And I would just say one more thing to the younger people who have family, older family members, get those oral histories. And again, when they say, oh, why is it, oh, why should I spend my time and why should I do all this? Okay, I've been a lawyer almost 40 years. And I think documenting a genocide is one of the most important things anyone can do in their life. And that's what these young people are doing. And so I find it immensely important. And I just hope the families out there, especially the large Turlock community, uh, can get involved in this project to have the families that have been there three, four generations now really engage them, bring them into the university and learn about Aaron's program and provide those stories and show those heirlooms. Thank you for sharing that very emotional testimonial, Kathy, as you did on August 7th, two years ago at California State University, which is the Assyrian Genocide Remembrance as we honor the martyrs. It, what really uh, resonates with me as I am a genocide survivor, as my grandparents survived, and it's resiliency. It is being the voice for the voiceless. And how lucky are we in these days and times that we have uh, individuals like Francis Sargis, and we have the cooperation and collaboration of a California State University and someone like you, Dr. Hughes, who is so qualified and is a, a scholar specialized in these 
uh, Assyrians' uh, diaspora and the genocide because what really matters is the resiliency. Resiliency is how our community and how our nation is defined. And to be able to raise awareness, one way to prevent future genocides from happening is to remember and condemn the ones that happened before by the words of my friend, Mr. Sabri Adman, founder and director of the Assyrian Genocide Research Center, or SAFO Center, as we call it. Ladies, is there anything that you would like to share as far as when we expect to see this exhibition come into fruition, and of course the venue of it, and again, how do uh, members of our nation, of our community, how do they contribute their testimonials or, Kathy, as you had, deeds that were relevant to that time period and that, that genocide, or as we called it, raqa raqa. It's important for people to know where they can bring all of this together so we can have a very meaningful exhibition. Uh, let me jump in first, if I can, on this, but I do want Aaron's input. Uh, we are putting together uh, some overtures uh, to see about funding from the California Humanities Program, the state program. And so many people have contributed to putting this project together. Aaron is going to be filing uh, an application very soon, in, with, uh, in about three four weeks. And uh, that um initiative describes in in great deal what we're looking for what we're trying to do we want oral histories as we've said we are going to have guest speakers we do want heirlooms small things that people may think of no consequence um from another friend of mine from uh, the chicago assyrian community i have a scarf of a woman who, mm. who walked on that same walk that my grandmother took and this woman walked, she had three small boys and took them on the road. That scarf is going to be in that exhibit to honor her, okay? Uh, I have a contact already from Australia. A, a woman sewed clothing in the camp, and her grandchildren kept those pieces of clothing, and that's going to be in there. We, any of these items that you know your ancestors took with them when they fled and have survived, those sorts of things are important to us baptismal records, church records, anything from that era. Uh, as to the exhibit itself, I believe we're looking at uh, maybe at starting at about the second quarter of next year. Uh, and Aaron, you can jump in th with the details, but we have time right now. The families have time to get acquainted with uh, the program, learn more about the program at Stan State, we have time and we will be devoting our time to go and meet people and do that outreach. They should not be shy about contacting us. Um, uh, Erin can probably give better contact info and how she would like to proceed with some of the collections. Certainly people are more than welcome to email me, uh, Carmen, and you have my email. I so do. if they have an inquiry, and there's an item or they can scan something and wonder, is this what you're talking about? Something like that. Uh, I am I'm more than happy to accept uh, emails and any, any scans, photos, that sort of thing. Kathy, a follow-up question for you. If someone has one of those heirlooms that they have held on to, if, it, if and when it is judged to be or to have merit to be included, <laughs> Will it be returned to its owners or will it be part of this exhibition and have a new home? How, how does that work? Uh, yes, we are, we are planning a limited exhibit, not permanent. So it is temporary. And uh, I think we are looking really at about a two to three month length of time. Any items that are shown in that exhibit will be returned to the, the people who submitted them, to the families, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. very good. That's important because yeah, oh, some absolutely. of these are so yeah. precious through the generations. I'm sure oh. they want to hold on to them. Um, oh, no Dr. Hughes, good. in closing, um, as the project director for this exhibition, and, and as Kathy mentioned, there is plenty of time, I would like to invite you both 
or whoever decides to be the contact person to periodically come on this program and to share more information uh, as we open our uh, contact or our information for providing more information for individuals who find out about this exhibition. They can contact you if there's any audio or video testimonials. Talk about the logistics of how they can actually be collected as well. This is a very exciting project, a very meaningful project, and I am so glad that you two ladies are collaborating on this. I am very proud of California State University Stanislaus for bringing this to us to the Central Valley, to the city of Turlock, and uh, we'll be talking to you a lot more in the coming weeks to provide more information and also to see how we can help and contribute to collecting a lot of this information. Uh, Kathy, in closing, is there anything you would like to leave our viewers or anyone who from the beginning of our conversation is beginning to think of what would, would this mean? Is there a certain time period that you would like to have uh, these uh, collectibles? Yes, we are looking, as, first of all, there, it, nothing is too soon. Uh, uh, contact us, bring the items, or scan them, send us emails, show us. Nothing is too soon. I would think certainly by very early 2021, we would want to have all of the decisions made. But we're looking at close to a year right now just for the call for exhibits to get as many of these items. And again, I would, I would encourage people uh, not to devalue uh, items they may have or think that they're insignificant. If they are from the era, uh, we are definitely interested in seeing them. Thank you, Kathy. And Dr. Aaron Hughes, in closing, is there anything you would like to add or conclude with as far as the role of uh, Stanislaus University? Um, well, and to iterate on, you know, Kathy's um, wonderful point that she just made, you know, nothing is too small. So her point earlier, you know, we're trying to document the genocide and then to help, um, you know, educate the public and share this uh, resource with the public. And so, um, like she said, you know, this is an incredible opportunity to document this history and to educate people on this history. And we're just so proud to be able to, you know, play a small part in helping make that um, publicly available. Thank you so much. Thank you both of you ladies for all that you do, for raising awareness, for being the voice for the voiceless. This concludes my conversation with Kathy Sayad Zatari and Dr. Aaron Hughes on The Modern Assyrian. Thank you so much, Carmen. Thank, Thank you. you. Stay with us for the next Modern Assyrian on A&B Set. My name is Carmen Morad.